Welcome to this week's Liverpool.com podcast. I'm Dan Morgan. I'm joined by Mark Wakefield and Joel Rabinovitz from Liverpool.com. Uh, a lot to get through, gents. Hope you're well. Um, another frustrating week for Liverpool. Uh, a big defeat to Manchester City. One we were all hoping wasn't going to be the case, but inevitably turned out so. And some some content on Liverpool.com that we're going to touch on and the general mood encapsulated in that. But firstly, Joel, it's very much now a a battle to secure top four, and you know you've written extensively on this on the squad on on the, the site on Monday that the squads um, need now to to refocus and reshape their aims for the season. I mean, just 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 purely from a from a, a mentality point of view, is there any way we can find a way to enjoy this now? Is there any way we can sort of reconfigure our expectations to a point where we get in a proper battle? For this top four and forget in many ways everything that's happened over the, the past season of, of being champions and and just sort of modestly find our, our feet in in a top four scrap. I hope so. Um my worry is that it's it's a difficult leap to make when you're a group of players who's is used to winning or getting to Champions League finals, winning the Champions League final in eighteen nineteen, getting ninety seven, ninety nine points in the league, winning the title last season that a quicker rate than any team's ever done before and getting used to just winning every single week no questions asked 26 out of the first 27 games last season that was just the norm for this team not that long ago and I think yeah making that that psychological shift from we have to win every single game to we don't have to win every single game and our absolute peak aspiration for the season now at least in terms of the league is top four I think is a difficult one for the players to make um and the, the slightly concerning thing, I suppose, is that the teams in and around them, um, especially the likes of sort of Everton, Leicester, West Ham, even Aston Villa, um, these teams who haven't been in the Champions League for a long time or, or ever before, um, for them, finishing top four is a huge thing. It's just one of the biggest achievements that have achieved in, in such a long time. Whereas for Liverpool, it will feel to those players like they've, not that they've let themselves down necessarily because of all the extenuating circumstances this season, but it will feel like a a difficult thing to go from being champions to trying to sort of rouse yourself to finish top four. Um, but as you said, on, on the flip side, there is, if you're looking for positives, they now can go into this last 15 games of the season, not feeling the pressure of, we have to take three points every single time we go out. So a draw here and there against whoever away from home, isn't the worst thing in the world. They've just got to be better than enough teams to finish in fourth. And it, I think if, as well, if we're looking at the table, things can change very quickly in either direction now. If you look below Liverpool, all the way down to ninth, Aston Villa are only five points behind. And I think they've got two games in hand. So if this run continues much longer, the table could look a lot uglier pretty soon. But the other side is Leicester and United are not very far away. And as we keep seeing every week, none of these teams really are building a kind of consistent run of wins. And all it takes is Liverpool to kind of win four or five on a bounce, which they are capable of doing. And suddenly you're looking at second as quite a realistic possibility. And I think that's what they've got to aim for. Yeah, I completely agree. I think, Mark, it's it's fundamental above everything else, above scoreboard pressure, above the league table pressure, that Liverpool finds a way to just start winning and playing well again and being consistent in that that lasts longer than than two games. Um, there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecies there at the minute. There's a lot of confidence issues. They've got to find a way to, first and foremost, shut the league off in many senses and just get back to themselves in terms of what they are, who they are. They've got the Champions League still, but you know you sort of have to treat that as a bonus now, in my opinion. Um, it's about winning games and winning the next game and then finding a way to win the game after that and then finding a way to win the game after that. That's what this team's been built on. That's what it needs to get back to. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, like you say, in terms of like, you know, the confidence issue, I think just to get in looking ahead to like the Leicester game, for example, I think certainly the strategies, the tactics, almost they've just almost got to go out the window for games like this at the moment with the, the run that they're in, you know. It's all about just getting the job over the line, getting the three points in whichever way they come really. Um, it's getting to that point now just to get the confidence boost, whether it's just a lucky goal, a penalty, anything like that. They've just try, got to try and get three points on the ball because, like Joel said, the teams in and around them, you know, uh, Everton, West Ham, even Chelsea, you know, Chelsea were all doom and gloom a few weeks ago. Then 
what three four games whatever it is on beating on the thomas tuchel they're all of a sudden back in the race so that's the that's the most boring thing the fact that not just that liverpool are in a low mood right now but the fact that everyone around them pretty much is the exact opposite they're on the state of euphoria to a certain extent for a lot of them um like i say no one's running away with games with the exception of man city who look all but set to win the league this year so it is a fight for second third and fourth um but like i said um the fact that there's not as much pressure to win every game now that's i think will work in their favor um the champions league like you say is a bonus but i think that will provide a nice little break a nice little bit of breather to try and get away from the league even get out of the country for a little bit uh, when they got uh, when they go to hungary next week just try and get shut their minds away from the the noise that's been around over the last few weeks um i said they had the highs of beating spurs and west ham but before that you know they hadn't scored for however many games and you've had two games there where they've had disappointing defeats you know say so they've just got to try and find a way of getting three points over line in whichever way they can do it you know it might take an ugly scrappy win away at leicester to do it they've got everton the week after at home which is certainly not going to be an easy game um but you know they've got to find a way of doing it or like you say the table could look much much uglier very very quickly i think i think everyone's fears joel are, are predicated on what it does financially um and what it does for for transfer plans and so on and so forth liverpool uh, are very strategic in that department. They plan years ahead, despite the fact that they signed two players on deadline day this year. That was very much, a, from what we're told, a, a context thing around personnel and injuries to Joel Matip. But the long-term planning, I think that the fears are based around what that does to them and how it impacts. And yeah, I just wonder how how much you think that is hugely relevant to 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 what's going on now and, and whether it could be a real issue for them if they don't make it. Yeah. Um I mean people often talk about just top four um without really putting any context around it and why it matters to just say, oh we need to finish top four because because that's what good teams do. And like you say, one of the biggest reasons, maybe the most important reason of all of them, uh is is the financial impact of getting in or not getting in, the damage that does. And I had a bit of a look into it this week for the piece, which is on the site. And in the last couple of seasons, so when Liverpool won the Champions League, um, I think they won close to 100 million, basically, from their European campaign in total, which is partly participation fees, partly for getting all the way to the final, looking at some of its TV money. But the, the overall package they got was about 100 million um, from winning it. Even last season, only getting to the last 16 and getting knocked out by Atletico Madrid, I think it was around 71 million so still quite a big drop from the previous season but still about 71 million that if you're not in it you don't get um and i think placing that in the context of where they are now in, in terms of the pandemic back going back to the summer there were some reports coming out that liverpool anticipated losing somewhere in the region of 100 million um as a result of the pandemic um reduced tv packages obviously lack of match day revenue commercial streams being hit as well so if you factor in that 100 million plus another, say, 70 to 100 million from not being in the Champions League, you've got this huge 200 million black hole, which then feeds into all kinds of things. Um, it wasn't that long ago, there were reports about Liverpool potentially extending the contracts of Alisson and Van Dijk. They're going to be on huge money, 200 plus grand a week, you'd think. Um, there'll be players that they would already have lined up um, for the upcoming summer window who they'll want to buy. We don't know who those are yet exactly, but all these things um, feed into it. And it's not just that, it's obviously kind of attractability to those transfer targets. If you're not in Europe's elite competition and, and Man United are, then Liverpool are at a distinct disadvantage there. Um, so there's all these things immediate term in terms of a summer window, but also the effect it has on next season as well. If you drop into the Europa League and it's a scenario none of us want to kind of contemplate, it's quite difficult to get out of of that kind of cycle we've seen it in previous kind of eras. Um, I think the last two times Liverpool were in the Champions League and then didn't qualify the following season. I think it was 2009-10, they slipped out. And then 2014-15, uh, it usually takes at least a couple of years to get back to where they need to be. And I think that's the most important thing, really, in terms of we can in years to come we can look back on this season as just a, a momentary blip a freak because of all the circumstances around it but as long as they get top four there's no reason why they can't rebuild and refresh ahead of a proper challenge again next season i think 
the, the real risk of missing out and dropping into fifth, sixth or whatever is that then it becomes quite difficult to just roll on into next season and actually kind of get back to the level they want to be at. Worst case scenario, Mark, that, that they don't make it. And look, there's a long way to go and we're going to come on to that. And I'm certainly not panicking yet. Um, but worst case scenario, they don't make Europe. They don't make the Champions League, rather. And they ask this group of players, essentially, probably minus Gini Wijnaldum now, to go again. That the worst thing in the world? We look at City as an example. They never really ripped the squad up this year. They bought... Decent level players, mid level players. Ferran Torres, you know, Diaz is a good player. We know that. Spent a lot of money on him. Um, but it's it's got the look of a of a city team that's been there for the last two years. I guess is my point. This Liverpool team, if it gets Virgil Van Dijk back, if it gets Joe Gomez back, if if it's lucky with injuries next season, if we have supporters back in Anfield regularly, if there's more of a balance to the schedule. This team, knowing what we know about it, asking them to go one more year, asking them to to try and get back what they've lost this year, would you would you be thinking that's the end of the world if that was the case? Uh, like I say, it's a tough one because, like you say, well, in terms of this season, the drop off, you like say there's a, a number of reasons you could put it down to, you know, lack of fans at Anfield, you know, the injuries, you know, that lack of a, you know. Uh, break in between seasons you know, there's a number of reasons why the drop off um, might have occurred this season like you say the lack of freshness in the squads um to ask them to go again i don't think in terms of playing the champions league or not playing champions league rather than having to go either in europa or nothing at all is the worst thing in the world but like you say you know, you've seen plenty of arguments in recent days and weeks that liverpool need to freshen the squad up getting a few players in obviously getting a wide album replacement in that, in that situation, that's much easier said than done because there's only one of him and there's a reason he's one of the best in the world. Um, if there was more of one of them, him out there, people would be signing him or Liverpool would be linked with him, simple as that. Um, to ask them to go again, like I say, in terms of the mentality of this squad, I've got no doubt about them. I think they would be able to go again. I think they'll be hungry to you know, give something back to the fans because, like I say, the last time fans were able to watch... Uh, certainly a full Anfield anyway was before the pandemic hit. Um, obviously, had a couple of games, you know, over December where a few sections of supporters were allowed in, but that's, you know, quite a minority in the grand scheme of things. But, you know, just being able to go get this, like I say, this, this group of players have been together for a long time in terms of without having any major, you know, additions or, you know, players leaving. Uh, Jota coming in, Thiago uh, this season. And then now the two new lads on deadline day, you know, after the World Champions, if they didn't sign any first team players, which obviously gets a lot of the highlight, but yeah, you know, at that point in time you can partly understand it. And then, you know, it was arguably justified when they went and won the league in record time the year after. But you can't see anything other than that this team does need a refresher. But in terms of going again next season, I don't have any worries about them being, you know less motivated if you like if they're not in the Champions League. I don't think that's an issue. I think Klopp will make sure that they're they're fully motivated. But yes, it's certainly going to be a big ask to go up against the likes of Man City. You know, United seems to be getting stronger. Chelsea, I think Chelsea have been going to be a very, very strong team next year once they've got um, had Scott settled on two chill. You know, there are a lot of other teams in there in the round as well that are going to be tough as well. So the lack of Champions League, obviously the financial reasons are the main one in that aspect, but being being motivated, yeah, it's certainly going to be interesting to see how they go about it if that doesn't happen. Whether or not they stick or twist is is one in which we can ponder, Joel, right now. I think one thing we often don't factor is natural development and, you know, sort of what we can do with the, what we've already got to an extent. You know, Mark talks about replacing Wijnaldum there, but we know that Curtis Jones has actually has been, you know, exponential this this season. Can he be the player who steps in and then doesn't replace Wijnaldum in inverted commas, but you know goes from playing thirty games a season to playing sort of fifty plus across four competitions, and, and becomes more relied on. Harvey Elliott comes back. You're going to have to find a, a place for Harvey Elliott in this squad next season. He looks that good. You know, he looks like. He's got all the talent in the world. There's got to be a decision made around. I think one of the main decisions, if I was pondering this, would be to say, 
what are they doing with Fabinho? Because if they decide Fabinho needs to be a six and can't be sort of fourth choice centre back, then they might just say, well, we don't need another midfielder. And you could argue that Tan and Ben Davis opens a door to that. But if they say, what if we get another situation like we have done and we're, we're committing to Fabinho as sort of joint third choice at centre half? We're not sure on Davis, Matip keeps getting injured, etc. Then you probably have to then you probably have to buy a midfield. I guess where I'm going with this is they might be backed into a corner to the point where they have to start working smarter about what they want to do around transfers. And that's not possible, really, because they're very smart at what they do. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the squad currently as it is, there's, there's already, you, you mentioned Elliot there, um, as one who could realistically come in and probably kind of play a similar role, if not bigger than Shakiri's played this season, coming off the bench, starting the occasional game. I think there's already a few areas you could pinpoint of kind of natural improvement, like you say, where they don't actually have to do an awful lot. Jones continuing to to get better is one of them. Getting a full season out of Jota is another one um, because go back to when he got injured, he was on course for sort of a 20, 25, if not 30 plus goal season. That's how good he was. It was almost not that far off kind of Salah's debut season levels. That's, that's kind of a level he mm. was at and, it might take him, we have to kind of be prepared, it might take him a few weeks um, to get back to that level, even if he does this season once he is back, uh, which we hope is kind of this month um, from that knee injury. But him over a full season, if he can play 40 games, say all competitions, that's just another huge source of goals, unpredictability off the bench that they didn't have um, for a huge chunk of this season. It's been really costly. Another one is Simikas. Um, Liverpool pinpointed that as a problem in the summer that Robertson last season was running to the ground at times and they didn't have a viable alternative. You couldn't really be asking Milner at his age to play that role too much. So they went and bought the best cover left back who would be happy to sit on a bench to play that role. Um, and there's a reason they went for him specifically and we've just not been able to see it. I think he's played four or five games or something in all competitions this season. It's barely any minutes at all. And I think we're seeing the effects of that with Robertson now. He's looked absolutely shot in recent weeks um, and you yeah. can't blame him but Klopp's been not able to rotate him at all I think he's played every single minute until Simakas came on against City I think that was Robertson's first time he's not been on the pitch in the league this season which you know, given we're in 23 games in now is is crazy so that's already another one if he can stay fit next season and you're playing Simakas for even 10 or 15 games and that allows you to have a fully fit Andy Robertson for the entire campaign yeah um that's another area they can get better. I think one last one I would touch on now, working on a piece today on it, is Cater. Um, and I believe Dave Lynch mentioned it in his column this week about him having quite a specific rehab programme on his own at the moment um, and Liverpool's choosing not to rush him back um, and make sure that he is right this time. And, you know, we could be sat here in a month's time having the same conversation about Cater coming back and getting another knock. I hope that's not the case, but he's one who... It's his birthday today. In fact, he turns 26. We forget that he's still only entering what should be the next two or three years really should be the peak of Cater. Mm -hmm. um, and it's unknowable at the moment how many games you will get out of him. But if they can somehow over the summer and now find a way to, to get his body right so that he can play 30 plus 40 games next season. Um, again, the numbers are there. The evidence is there to show that Liverpool generally are a better team when he's fit. So, yeah. There just are, to come there back are to you ways. on that, sorry, just to come back to you on that, I mean, just the, the point I made to Mark before, the the getting them to go again, we know we know how strong they are mentally. You don't get to 97 and 98 points, you don't win a European Cup without the belief that they've got. They'll be hurting right now. You know, they, they will be, there'll be no one hurting more than them at what's happened this season. There'll be no one hurting more than them that they still didn't get to celebrate the league title after they won it. There'll be no one hurting more than them that they they can't get to to sustain success year on year. And you know, we we seen all the narrative around the pill with Roy Keane this week about being bad champions and stuff like that, which I don't really want to get into on here. I think we're better than that. But at the same time, what I would say is that regardless of ins and outs, regardless of whether Liverpool stick or twist in the transfer market, there should be if if things are if things are normal and things are uh, as they have been in the last two years with this club and this team and this squad, there should be 
an innate desire and hunger to go and put that right because it is not this team and it's not what they've created for themselves. It's not the levels and standards it's created for themselves. So the mental recovery is going to be a big factor, I think. And I just wonder whether, you know, that will be sort of the leading spearhead of, of how this this now gets put into place for, for Liverpool moving on to next season. Yeah, you'd like to think they they want to prove a point over these next four months. And you know, they've come too far as a group of players and achieved too much to be remembered in years to come as the champions who just faded away after one season. And I, I actually think it's a difficult acceptance for all of us and the players themselves to make over these last few weeks that the title was gone and the top four is everything. But I, I actually think if they do get to May and they manage to get that over the line, they can all take some form of pride, I think. Even if at the start of the season, if you'd said top four was was all they were going to achieve, you'd have said, well, that's a, a poor title defence. I think you could actually say that's quite a big achievement given all we've mm-hmm. had to kind of process this season if they do manage it. So you'd like to think so. And the other point I'd, I'd make in terms of where they are now um, is going all the way back to, to Klopp's first full season in 16-17. Now, I know a lot of those players have moved on and, and new ones have come in. And you have the likes of of Lucas and, and Chan and Klein, different goalkeepers back then. But quite a few of those players are still kind of key parts of a dressing room now and playing Wijnaldum, Henderson, Milner, Mane, Firmino. They're still around and they went through a very similar kind of thing. Um, not off the back of being champions, obviously. They were still an up-and-coming team at that point. Um, but they went through... They were in a title race almost um, in 16-17 until around Christmas time, them and Chelsea... Yeah. And then they just dropped off a cliff after New Year. There was the draw against Sunderland away. And then they went on a run kind of similar to this. I think they didn't win in nine games. And it, the parallels are almost uncanny. They won a couple of games out of nowhere against Tottenham and Arsenal uh, in February. Um, and then it was a defeat to Hull, which kind of brought them back down to earth, a little bit like we've had recently. Um, and then they lose Mane in the derby to injury and he's out for the season. So quite a lot of parallels there and they did manage to kind of pull themselves through by playing a really pragmatic quite ugly style of football remember those wins against Stoke away West Brom away Watford away yeah. and then the last couple of games um <clears throat> West Ham away and Middlesbrough they just spring back into life again and they get themselves over in the very last day of the season against Middlesbrough but my point is a lot of those players have that collective experience and we all know even if the points tally isn't what it should be now this Liverpool team is is worlds away from the 16-17 version. And I think yeah. you need to kind of summon some of that spirit and just, yeah, grind some of those wins out, like you say, and and accept that it's, it might it might involve a horrible 1-0 against Leicester away to kind of reignite that spark. But they, they have done it before and they've got a hell of a lot more quality uh, to draw on than they used to have. So the, the road ahead, Mark, as I mentioned before, it's it's a long one. Four months of football is a lot of football and a lot of things can change um, in a season from February to May. We did a piece the other day on the site where the three of us sort of pondered the fixtures that remained, where Liverpool's bumps in the road would lie and how many points they would get. Um, I did my piece and just looking at it now, you know, it's it's not... It's maybe the it, well, it is the most positive one, but I don't think it's the most unrealistic one, to be honest. Um, you know, we 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 have to na- navigate some really tough fixtures in February. As I'm looking at this, City result changes everything, but then there's Leicester, Everton, Sheffield United. Um, March it gets a little bit more difficult and tricky with games like Fulham, which isn't a banker when considering how they played against us and how we've been at home. Chelsea and Wolves aren't, aren't great. I said that I really expect Liverpool to kick on April onwards. You know, there's there's tough games in there, Villa and Arsenal, Leeds, etc. But, you know, I, I predicate that on Liverpool finding the feet again um, and hopefully banking that the season isn't, all isn't lost at that point. Um, so I would say, well, I did predict that Liverpool would take 35 points out of the remaining 15 games, which would leave them with a total of 75, which in this season is enough to guarantee your top three, in my opinion. Um, just looking at yours now, you, you predicted 32 points, leaving a total of 72, which I'd say, again, is a is enough to finish top four, um, probably at a scrape. But 
you know, just looking through it now, where did where did you see Liverpool's um, peaks and troughs coming over the, over the final four months? Uh, yeah, I mean, I say I think out of the three of us, I'm somewhere in the middle in terms of optimism um, of the points they'll get. I mean, firstly, I think in terms of February, the main remaining games in February, I think they just the imperative thing is not to get beat. I think they've got to try and go unbeaten in the three main league games: Everton, Leicester, Everton, Leicester, Sheffield United. No, it's they might not have to win all three of them. I personally don't think they will, but you know they've got to try and make sure not as much damage is done. Um, you know, look at some of the games there in March. You've got uh, Chelsea in there, Wolves. You know, I think I, pre- I can't remember the top of my head, but I think I predicted that they lose to Wolves. But I think Chelsea, you know, for some reason we seem to up our game against them. Um, but you know, there's certainly going to be some tough games along the road then. All in, all, in my opinion, all the roads lead to Old Trafford in, in May. You know, I think rather start than May, they've got Old Trafford. I think they go to that game if they're in, certainly in with a shout. I mean, I think that's probably about three or four games or four, whatever in the final five games when you get to that point. Um, you know, they've got to try and make sure that certainly get into the last few games that they're within touching distance of top four. I don't, I think it could easily go down to the last game of the season. Um, I think it gets it against Crystal Palace. I can't remember off the top of my head who it is, but um, yeah, it's certainly going to be a tight one. Yeah, exactly. So Chris Palace, at least they're at home on the last day. That hopefully should help. But given the recent record, you never know. Um, so yeah, um, Leeds away terrifies me. You know they're an absolutely fantastic side to watch, um, especially on their own patch. You know they're a brilliant team. You know make you work hard, and you know. I think um, Everton won there, which is a very good win, but most of the time they don't make it easy for you. I think City drew there early in the season when they went at their best. Um, you know, it's just it's Arsenal, you never know what you're going to get. You know, they're a really like classic bogey team, if you like. You know, I think they lost there, obviously, after the restart, but quite a lot of time we do struggle to get our best performances um, there against them. But, yeah, it's a mixed bag of results. Like you say, the, the running, barring uh, the trip to Old Trafford, is quite kind on paper. But, you know, given the, the losses to Brighton, Burnley, you know, Southampton draws with Newcastle, West Brom, nothing to give in at this point. But I think key to that is making sure that if they get to the Sheffield United game or get to, you know, start of March, make sure that there's not much, not more damage that's been done because, like I say, it's a confidence thing. If they get into March and they're still like, if they drop out of the top four and they've still got, got three or four points to chase on the likes of, Villa, Villa, Leicester, Chelsea, West Ham, whoever it is in that position, they'll have the work to do. So the next few games are certainly going to be imperative to the, sustaining that challenge. Joel, you went for 26 points, which would offer a total of 66. Um, that is a pretty grim reality, uh, <laughs> but a possibility. Where, where did you think it would um, be lost, if you like? Um, well, disclaimer, I mean, we, we did this on the Monday straight after the 4-1 yeah. in City, so I don't think any of us are in the most optimistic of moves, certainly not myself, because um, I worked the game on Sunday night. And yeah, I was feeling a bit down about it. And it, it, it's difficult to to kind of project ahead because we have no sense of, of what Liverpool's form is like going to Arsenal away, for example. So if you, you ask me right now, am I confident Liverpool beating Arsenal or Leeds? I'm going to say no, because that's what they've been been like for the last six weeks, really, since Christmas time. And I think my thinking when we did this exercise was off the back of, it's nine games now, I think nine points, nine games. So that's essentially 25% of a season worth of not much over relegation form, really. And we, it's impossible to say, how quickly that changes or how much it changes. And I didn't do it on purpose, but actually the 66 point total that I came out with is exactly the tally they're on track for if you take their current points per game and extrapolate it across 38. So I know it sounds really pessimistic, but it is what they're on course for. It would require an upturn for them to get better than that. If I'm looking for positives, it's that that currently has them in fourth. And I know there's teams behind them with games in hand. I actually, this could be, come back to make me look silly I do actually think fourth might get in with less than 70 points this season um I was having a look at Leicester early I think they're if they carry on at the same rate they'll get 71 and United maybe 74 so it is going to be a lower total um I think it's only two of the last 15 seasons that teams have got in with as low as 66 points so it would be 
an anomaly season. Um, but when I was looking at those those runs of games, I think the one that that maybe concerns me most, looking at it on paper now, is is the April run. Um, there's not a single one of them. Arsenal away, Aston Villa at home, Leeds away, Newcastle at home, where I feel that comfortable. Um, and again, if Liverpool go into that off the back of three or four wins beforehand, then obviously your perspective is completely different. I just think all of those teams, for different reasons, I can see causing quite a few problems. Um, like you guys have mentioned, there's that Old Trafford trip. And in the last four, Southampton, West Brom, Burnley, Palace, uh, you've just got to think that if they know what they need to do uh, going into that stretch and they know exactly how many points will get them there, you think with the kind of the knowledge and the experience and the know-how they've had in pressure moments, they'd be able to hold their nerve better than all those teams around them. Um, and they might even have a cushion at that point. They could even be second or third and going in with a gap and it's not even a case of trying to claw their way in at the end. But I think, yeah, looking ahead, predicting results with a kind of the last six weeks in mind, um, I did see even dropping a fair few in the last 15. We shall see. We shall see. That's been this week's Liverpool.com podcast. Huge thanks to Joel and to Mark. And head over to Liverpool.com for those pieces. I think we're going to put a link to them um, on YouTube if you want to read them. But we've got tons of other stuff. Kylian Mbappe, uh, FSG, Super Leagues. Um, a myriad of content for you over there. So get over and, and have a read and, and take in the... The stuff that's on there and we'll sure to bring you everything as it as it happens with Liverpool and, and give you our take as it comes. But for now, um that's been us for this week and we'll see you again next week. <laughs>